Praise the Lord. And I see Priscilla back there, Lonnie's mother, Priscilla. We're so glad to see you back with us. Amen. Great. Isn't this wonderful? Well, the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so in Psalm 107, verse 2. So we need to shout to the Lord. That's what Daryl is going to sing. And then one day he's going to shout. We'll shout to the Lord. One day he's going to descend and come back for us with a shout. And we're going to, he's going to take us on home to be with him with those brand new bodies. So let's shout to the Lord today. Amen. Children may go at this time. Amen. Please open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. The Gospel of John, chapter 4. 
Children are such a blessing. And uh, you know, sports, this is when uh, sports becomes, becomes a big thing a lot of times, that's to children. And uh, I know uh, both Grant and uh, Kayla are real involved in soccer and doing a good job. They both won, they said, this last weekend. That's always nice to win, isn't it? And Jason is heavily involved in the soccer program, so he gets to, gets to know a lot of these kids and have an influence on these kids' lives. And that's very important. Um, and so all of us, you know, we, we uh, look, and I know Ron there, he has some grandchildren. They're very involved in uh, sports. Uh, we learn a lot from sports, don't we? And, uh, you, know, it, it, you, know, you know, it's a possibility this year we may have a freeway World Series. Wouldn't that be something if the Dodgers and the Angels both got into the World Series? That would be great. <laughs> I'm rooting for it. That'd be... That'd be something else. I haven't had one of those in many years. You know, in New York, they used to have freeway series every once in a while, but uh, I don't know if we've ever had one here, have we? I don't think so in Los Angeles. So that would be something that'd be great if it did happen. But right now, let's look at John chapter 4, and I'm going to be reading from verse 7 through 23 in John chapter 4, beginning in verse number 7. <clears throat> There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink. Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that saidst thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know not what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we ask now that you would give us quality time in this message. Help us to listen only to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I pray, God, you'd give me wisdom and guidance and clarity of speech as well as clarity of thought. Lord, I pray that uh, if there be one without Christ Jesus, Lord and Savior today, I pray they'd come to realize their lost condition before a holy God. And may they come to know Jesus personally as both Lord and Savior. And God, meet the needs of each person, of all the children as they listen to the word today, and the adults as well. Lord, may we all be impacted by the very word of God, this, the truth, God's holy truth. And we'll give you thanks in advance in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you were to ask a number of people what worship is, you would probably get a number of different answers. I doubt that you'd find uh, very many people say the same thing. 
There's just not a real good uh, understanding and commonality about what worship is. And the primary reason for that is that there's a wide range of backgrounds and experiences. Many of us are from various places. Uh, when you come to California, you find that many, many Californians are from somewhere else, the Midwest, down in the South, from overseas, from different places. And that's what makes it so interesting around Los Angeles. You can find about every culture there is. Just go out just a few miles from our door and you'd find all kinds of different cultures and backgrounds, experiences. So there's a different, different understandings about what worship is. But another reason for that is there's a wide range of views of worship, and this is a never-ending list of worship misconceptions. And perhaps the biggest misconception is that worship is for us. We look at it from a, in a, in a sense, a selfish attitude, thinking that worship is for us. And when I go to worship, I can get something out of worship for myself. Now, uh, while that will happen, you will get something from it, yes, but it's a byproduct of worship. We're to give to God. We need to realize that worship is something that we do for God, not for ourselves. We worship God first, and uh, realizing that he's number one in our life, we, we, we reveal and, and uh, display our love for him. And then, of course, we receive a blessing for it. But it begins with giving, just like anything else in the Christian walk. We give first, and that's what worship really is. Another misconception is the notion that if I do a certain set of religious activities, I have worshiped. Uh, this was the misconception of the people of Israel. When the Lord said in Malachi chapter 1, verse 10, he said this, Oh, that someone would shut the temple doors so that thy, my people would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. Some people think that if they've done things a certain way, what we call a ritualism, uh, that they have worshipped God. It's a form that many people go through. It's, that's all it is, is a form. Look with me at Mark chapter 7. I don't have this in your notes, so uh, add this on if you would, please. Uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 6. Here the Lord Jesus is speaking to the scribes and Pharisees, and in verse 6 of Mark chapter 7, he says, uh, He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah the prophet, uh, has uh, Isaiah prophesied, there it is, of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. So it's a ritualism. I mean, everything's done exactly the same way every time. Uh, and people just go through a form of ritual or a habit rather than something that comes spontaneously from the heart. Now, perhaps some of the contributing factors to these common misunderstandings are our expectations of worship. When we come to worship God, some expect an intellectual stimulation from the sermon. <laughs> now, you're gonna, it's going to be harder to do that with me because I'm a simple country boy. <laughs> and maybe I don't stimu stimulate your intellect, maybe as much as some do. But uh, that's not the primary reason we come. If they are intellectually stimulated, then worship has taken place. Now, I believe that uh, one of the great things about our church and about churches like ours is that uh, we stand on doctrine. We believe the gospel. That's first and foremost. We preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But we go further than that. We build upon that foundation of Jesus Christ, and we believe doctrine. We have many doctrines that we teach and preach. And uh, that's one of the things that I've mentioned about our hymns. You know, when you get take the... Uh, praise songs and worship songs, those are great, but we need to build on that with doctrine. And the hymns, like if you look in our hymnal, these songs are based on doctrine, and you'll find a lot of doctrine 
in him. So I think we need both. And that's why we try to blend them together. And then I like songs that are written today, contemporary songs, because God's alive today. And I believe God's still giving music today. So I think we need to have a good mixture of all this kind of music. But some expect intellectual stimulation. And then some expect a form of entertainment. Now they may not call it that. But many people come to church and go to worship God expecting a form of entertainment. And if they are entertained, all of a sudden they say, worship has taken place. And if their expectation is not met, worship did not happen, you see. Now what we must understand this morning is that worship is not about intellect or entertainment, but it's about an encounter with God Almighty. That's what worship is. It's an encounter. It's meeting with God. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And when I come to worship God, I want to be able to go, go away later saying, I have met with God. And God has spoken to my heart. And, and it's been great meeting with the Lord. Now that's worship. And you have an encounter with God. Now in John chapter 4, it helps us to understand better what worship truly is. In verse 20 of our text, and this is in John chapter 4, verse 20, this woman, this Samaritan woman said, Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Then look at verse 9, back up to verse 9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me? which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now, these Samaritans came out of the Assyrian uh, <coughs> captivity when they took the, the northern kingdom uh, captive in about 722 B.C. And uh, <coughs> we find that the, there were people that intermarried there. The Jews, the people that were taken captive, intermarried with their captors. They ended up uh, going to Samaria here and became known as the Samaritans. Later on, the southern kingdom was taken captive of the Babylons, uh, Babylonian Empire. But first, it was the northern kingdom taken captivity by the Assyrians. This is where the Samaritans came from. In other words, the Samaritans were half and half. They were half Jews they were, uh, and half uh, Assyrian, and they were called Samaritans what uh, we would call uh, in a kind of a, a bad term in a way, half-breed. That's what they used to call them sometimes back in uh, the late 1800s, especially when the uh, whites came here and began intermarrying with the uh, American Indians, the Native Americans, we call them now, the uh, Indians, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, and a lot of times when someone is half and half, nobody will claim them. And it's sad. But this woman said, we, I'm a Samaritan. We don't have anything, and the Jews won't have anything to do with us. You see, there's that division. So there was a cultural barrier, which sometimes that takes place even in the world today. To the faithful of Judah, these Samaritans were unfaithful half-breeds, and they wanted nothing to do with them. And as a result, the Samaritans developed their own system of worship and even built their own temple in Jerusalem, which is a mountain in the vicinity of the we, uh, present West Bank city of Nablus, which is Shechem, the biblical city of Shechem. So they even built their own temple there and had their own form of worship. So there was a cultural barrier. And in verse 20, this woman is saying, my people have their place of worship on this mountain right behind me. You Jews go to your temple in Jerusalem. Now I've got a question. Which one is right? People are asking that all the time. Which one is right? Have the different religions, different denominations, different this and that. Which one is right? And that's why it's very important for us to study the word and to know what we believe. And when you come to a Bible doctrine and it becomes a conviction in your life, it'll stay with you. Don't believe something just out of convenience or because it's popular but believe it because God settled it in your heart. And uh, that's what, what happened to me with uh, the doctrine of the local church when I was first pastoring 
I was challenged on that, the, the church. Is the church invisible, universal, or is it local, something you can see? And uh, I had to come to a biblical conviction. And that's a true Baptist doctrine, and uh, you know, knowing what the church is. And it's very important that we have conviction in our beliefs about the inspiration of Scripture, and especially about uh, the virgin birth, uh, the deity of Christ, all of these things. We need to know what we believe and have conviction about it and stand upon it. I like what Bono has been saying of you too, Bono. He's been complimenting Billy Graham a great deal. And I thank God for that. That uh, Billy Graham has a tremendous testimony. People uh, rem uh, admire him and respect him because of all these years of his being faithful and standing true to the word of God. Now in countless churches today, congregations struggle with the same question. Committees are established, task teams are appointed, all in an effort to discover which one is right, which style of worship is right. And there's different ones, and I think that uh, we have to make evaluation on the people we're trying to reach and all of that, because we're here to seek the lost. And some churches have only a very contemporary style of worship. Some of us may not feel comfortable there. Uh, and then some may have nothing but... Uh, uh, the, the old hymns, and so on. But I, I believe that we need to make uh, evaluation of who we're trying to reach and not only to satisfy us. That's not Worship isn't about me getting something. Worship is more about giving to the Lord. And if we can see that we can reach more people with the gospel, we ought not to be so self-centered or so demanding that we want to have what we want that we would let people be lost and go to hell and not even try to reach them with a style of music that they, that they can identify with. These things are very important. Now, younger people want something contemporary, while older folks <laughs> defend traditional forms. What we need to understand this morning is that neither synthesizers nor 18th century hymns guarantee genuine worship that engages the Spirit of God. I mean, you'll find a church over here that's very contemporary. God's blessing them. What, what, another one over here, they just use the hymns and God's blessing them. But it's not the style of worship so much as they're being, being blessed for. It's that they're doing what God has told them to do and they're wanting to please God in their worship. And we find in verses 21 through 23, Jesus says, in essence, he's saying, it's not a question of which one is right for a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And it, I don't, it dawned me one time, these hymns that we sing in our hymnal, there was a time when that was contemporary music. There was a time when those were new. So, you know, when you look at things, uh, we, we need to realize that we're trying to reach people of all ages. And our church, we're, we're just trying to reach as many as we can of all ages. We're here to get the gospel out to all people. Now, when Jesus made this statement, he's teaching us some important truths about worship. I want you to notice in your notes now to fill these two, uh, two points out. Number one in your notes, a time is coming and has now come when worship will no longer be associated with a place. With a place. Uh, this woman, the Samaria, she was talking about the temple that was uh, that the Samaritans worshipped in, and then, and then referring also to the Jews had the temple in uh, Jerusalem they they worshipped in. But worship is there's going to be a time when we're going to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, and there's and worship will not be associated with a place. Have we ever done this? You see, we tell people that we have worship at Church of Redondo Hills, nine thirty on Sunday morning. And uh, it must be true because, uh, where's my bulletin? Well, there it is. Because it says so in my bulletin. 9.30 Sunday morning, we have worship. <laughs> but let's don't fall into the, uh, into the falsehood. That's the only time we can worship God. Thank God we can worship God every day. It's an attitude. That's what worship is, an attitude of worship. And we can do that at home. We can do that any place. And I love these cheerleaders. Yeah, some college, they, they, they said, you can't uh, pray at the game anymore. And they just went ahead and did it anyway. You know, we, got, we need to, Christian people, we need to have some civil 
disturb, uh, civil uh, you know, rights. I mean, stand up for what's right, and if someone has to go to jail, that might happen someday before long. But we've got to get, quit this thing thinking if the government tells you something, you've got to do what they tell you to do. There was a time when Martin Luther King Jr., he set a good, a good example on how to do this. And we as Christians, we need to stand up and need to say, it. you might say we can't pray, but we're going to go ahead and do it anyway. And those cheerleaders, they held hands and they just went ahead and prayed anyway. And as far as I know, they're still not in jail. But thank God for some people who, who stand for something. About time we began doing that right now before it's too late. We need to stand up. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Scripture says what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Our body is the temple. That's where the Holy Spirit dwells. I can worship God any place because He dwells in me. You see, out on the prairie, around the campfire, sitting around the table there in the Cocos or Starbucks or Pyology, <laughs> in and out uh, Chick-fil-A, wherever it is, wherever it is, just sit there and we can worship the Lord together as God's people. Amen? I, I like that. And in John 1, 14, the Word was made flesh. This is talking about Jesus. And dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We're to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Talks about the Word here. Uh, we had a good time yesterday at the Bible study about the a body referred to as the tabernacle, a tent. And here he, in 1 Corinthians, we read that, a, a temple. But the thing is that God dwells in us. And then among us as we come together in the name of the Lord. Yes, he is Emmanuel. He's God with us. His presence, thus the place of worship, is no longer centered in the temple of Jerusalem. He doesn't dwell in a building made by hands. He dwells in this building that he created. You see, worship is centered in the heart of every believer. And if you go to church thinking you're going to the place of worship, then you do not understand worship. The church is a place of fellowship where united worship takes place. But it's not the place of worship. It takes place there. But it's not the place of worship. And uh, Tony Evans, he said these, these words. He said, if you limit worship to where you are, the minute you leave the place of worship, you will leave your attitude of worship behind like a crumpled up church bulletin. <laughs> That's about true. When we leave this place, we're still to be in the attitude of worship no matter where we go. You need to understand that you can take worship with you when you leave today because worship should no longer be associated with a place. We call this the worship center. We come in here and uh, we come into to this place, but the worship isn't in, it doesn't, in this building, when we leave, it, the worship takes place in our heart, and then corporately together as we worship the Lord. Now, number two in your notes, a time is coming and has now come when worship will be done in spirit and in truth. All right, this is what we see here. Now, what this means is that you do not measure worship by your level of entertainment. You say, man, I just really felt good today. That was such good. This or that. And, you know, I was so entertained. Just really tickled. Oh, I was good. <laughs> uh, we don't measure worship by entertainment or your personal satisfaction. As a matter of fact, sometimes we may not feel very comfortable at all at church because there might be something in our life that's not right. When the preacher preaches the word of God, the Holy Spirit convicts us. And we might not feel too good right then, but we're going to feel better later <laughs> once we get right with God, you see. So your personal satisfaction or your level of comfort, your level of comfort. And we try to keep people, the atmosphere, like in a restaurant they call it ambiance, but I, I, I call it the atmosphere. We try to keep it as comfortable as possible because we want you to be able to listen to the word. I'm, the chairs, I think, are about the most comfortable chairs you can get for, uh, in, in a <clears throat> church. <clears throat> excuse me, but we come and we don't measure our worship by those things. We measure our worship by having an encounter, as I said earlier, with God. 
And what this means is that worship is not dependent upon a place. There's been times when we worked on the building here and we met downstairs for, for a while. And we have a picture of that where all, there was nothing here except for the ceiling on the roof. And uh, painted that and then brought the chairs in. <laughs> Took the pews out and then later we brought the chairs in. And so we met, I don't know how long it was, a number of weeks, down in the, what we call the coffee house. We had church down there, but we still worship God. It isn't confined to a place. Wherever the people are, that's the place of worship. It's determined by our attitude. And so let's look. The presence of the Holy Spirit is not determined by the bricks of the building, if you have bricks, or by the color of the carpet, or by the stained glass windows, or by the cross and the candles. The presence of the Holy Spirit is not determined by the pulpit. You know, there's different kinds of pulpits. You can get plastic ones where they clear. And those are nice. There's a lot of nice different kinds of pulpits, but that doesn't determine uh, whether the Holy Spirit's there or not. Or by the organ or keyboard or piano or guitar or whatever it is, that doesn't determine the presence of the Holy Spirit. Even the pastor doesn't determine that by himself. It takes all of us together. And we need to have the presence of of the Holy Spirit. It's determined by the attitude of the worshiper. That's what determines the presence of the Holy Spirit. If you walk away from a worship experience saying with the psalmist, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. That's found in Psalm 96 verse 4. Let me say that again. If you walk away with the attitude of that psalmist, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised you've had an encounter with God, then you can say, I have worshiped God today. But if you walk away from a worship experience voicing criticism about why you didn't like this or you didn't like that, it's fair to say that you have not experienced worship. That was like that family was going home after church and the dad said, man, that was a lousy sermon today, wasn't it? Mama said, man, those ushers, they just did a terrible job. Little boy said, man, people just weren't very friendly. They were, the little girl said, I think it was a pretty good show for nickel. So, <laughs> so the, the uh, moral of the story is you get out of it about what you put into it. Amen? Yes. And uh, <clears throat> so we want to experience real worship. This is how you measure worship, not by... We don't want to have criticism about it. You hold the same position that the Samaritan woman held then. You hold the same position that the Pharisees held when you're judgmental. You hold the same position that the people of Malachi's day held. And the Lord says in response to that position, a day is coming and now has come when they worship will be done in spirit and in truth. And that's the kind of worshipers the Lord is seeking today. John 4, 23. Let's look at it one more time. Jesus said in John 4, 23, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Here's the truth. God's holy word. Worship him in spirit and in truth. And the Holy Spirit teaches us from this book right here. He's the teacher. The word of God is our manual. This is 101 on life. This is our book. This is God's book to us. His love letter to his people. And oh, how God will bless us if we hold to the truth. Yes, there are many people ridicule the Bible. That's been going on a long time, long, long before the now. It's still God's word, still stands true. May God's word be true in every man a liar. Let's just line up with his book, his word. Can't go wrong then. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we ask now that you'd continue to bless throughout this day. Draw us ever nearer to Christ. And Lord, if there be one without a saving knowledge of Christ today, may they come to know him whom to know aright is life eternal. And for thy children, O oh God, 
Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, not in form, uh, but Lord, uh, but in spirit and in truth. May the Holy Spirit, we know what it says that where there's a, a liberal a freedom, there's, there's the Holy Spirit. He gives freedom. The Holy Spirit gives us that liberty and we thank God for it. Now as their heads are bowed and eyes are closed, are there those that would say, I'm a believer, I know Christ as my Lord and Savior, but I have not been worshiping, worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. And I want you to pray with me, Pastor, that, that I'll put Him first in my life, that I'll worship Him in spirit and in truth. Would you raise your hand and say, pray with me about that? Amen. Thank you. And there's a number, and, and I certainly want you to pray with me and as well. It's two-way street here. Anyone else? All right, is there anyone that has not received Christ? Uh, how many of us know on the authority of God's word that we're saved? And if we would die right now, we know we'd go to heaven on the authority of God's word. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. No one is looking around. Just raise your hand and say, yes, I know that for sure. Just slip your hand up to God and then put it right back down. Now I'm going to look on and offer my uh, min uh, service as a minister of the gospel. Is there a man, woman, boy, or girl that would say, preacher, pray with me and pray for me? I want to be sure that I'm a child of God. Would you raise your hand and say, pray with me about that? Amen. Amen. If you need to go on to 201, 301, if you haven't taken 101, would you raise your hand and say, preacher, pray with me that I'll, that I'll go on in my spiritual walk, that I'll grow in the Lord and do what he wants me to do, that I'll be committed to him in that area? Yes, thank you. Amen. Anyone else? Now, Lord God, you've seen each hand raised, and more importantly, you've seen our heart, and you see our heart right now. We ask that you'd have your way, your will performed in every one of our lives. We commit it into thy care in the name above every name, the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen.